If you've heard some folks play those passages with such crispiness and brilliance, but you're tired of only finding theoretical advice on how to achieve that, in this video you'll find the entire outline and practical steps on how to play like that. You don't have to wait years to get there. My name is Olga, your online music teacher. Watch till the end if you want me to review your performance or specific issue that you might have. You don't want to miss instructions on how to do that. Before I get to specific methods I use to achieve agility in passages while keeping the clarity, let me tell you this story about you. You have probably tried some piano before or you've been studying for a little while until one day when you got really excited about that one piece and decided to try it on the piano. You've got the sheet music, played it through and all of a sudden you can't get one passage smoothly without clear signs of struggle. You almost felt ready to show off your piano skills to your crush, but then that passage. But don't worry, here's what you do. Sight read the passage, figure out fingering and write them down with a pencil so you can erase it if you change your mind. Play through both hands a couple of times. If it's too difficult, you can do those methods one hand at a time first. Or you can drill a little bit just to be able to somehow connect it with both hands, making sure the fingering is good. You'll want to consult your teacher and make sure you know how to perform each element because after practicing with these methods, you'll get it solid. So you want to make sure you're getting the right thing practiced or you'll have to spend three times as much time to unlearn it. With my students, we usually skip this first method because I try not to make it too crazy of a level up so that they can at least roughly play through. But occasionally we'll find that it's better to start with the adding method or the addition method, however you want to call it. The way it works is you would play two sixteenth notes and freeze on the last one. Repeat a couple of times even if you think you got it. When you stop at that last note and wait a little bit, your finger muscle makes a better memory of that key. You reinforce it by focusing your ear on hearing it because it's prolonged and you visually memorize the position. All those senses combined together reinforce the memorization you never knew was your ability all along. After you did that, you would add one more note vertically and play it multiple times as well. Do that to the whole passage and then move on to the next method. It gets pretty time consuming. That's why we, piano teachers, usually recommend you to keep your passage pretty short in the beginning. So it doesn't discourage you from practice and you can notice a big improvement in that little segment. That should encourage you to practice again tomorrow and serve as a little proof that those methods work. By the way, I attached the link to the document summarizing all of these methods. As you're listening, you might want to download it and keep referring to it. After you watch this video, you will actually have a very practical plan to follow. Put that paper by your piano and practice with purpose next time you do that. The next method is what I call the dotted method. You will notice that all those methods I will cover today will include stopping at each note of the passage following a particular pattern. In 2-4, 3-4 and 4-4 time signatures, it will look like this. You will have to analyze how beaming or grouping works in your particular piece or passage, but usually in those time signatures, 16th notes are beamed in groups of four. You will break those in sequences of two notes only, meaning you will freeze at the odds first and play the events rapidly all the way through your passage. Again, from this visual, you'll stop at number one and play number two fast. Your attention should be enough to make sure you will be performing that little sequence correctly. You will play it through at least three times, even if you think you got it. If you made one mistake, that doesn't count. You have to play it again then. You can play as slow as you need to, but try your best to not make any mistakes, because if you do, you'll memorize your mistakes. After you've practiced this passage, stopping at the first note of the sequence three times, 
move on to the second part of this method and instead stop at the second note while playing the first one pretty rapidly. Also replay that three times. Because you can now perform that transition fast between each neighboring note, you will eventually be able to play with incredible agility down the road, even though it feels like you're playing overall slowly now. I know, it sounds boring and you don't get to see the whole picture while you're practicing like this, but that's how you practice the specific passages. You don't have to do that to the entire piece, unless your entire piece consists of those passages, like some more advanced pieces, when you don't even have a break. Next is non legato method. Non legato just means to play everything detached. And that's simply what you do. But make sure it's not staccato while you're playing sharply. You'll have to keep your hand and fingers nicely curved and perform that non legato firmly. One huge side note on performing every single one of those methods. As you've played one note, you have to prepare the next finger for the following key at the exact moment as you played the previous note. Here is what it looks like. Sometimes it's impossible due to passage specifics, but for the most part it's a great habit to do so. Guess what? You'll have to play that passage three times as well, with non legato. After that point, I would only teach the next method if the student had some experience practicing with adding, dotted and non legato methods. Students have to adjust to having patience with those first couple of methods before learning the stop method. It's actually pretty easy to understand, but being able to make yourself commit to practicing all those methods in this sequence in one sitting, like we do it how it's supposed to be, is pretty challenging. With the stop method, pattern possibilities are almost endless. It's again about the stopping at each note of the passage, but following a different pattern now. This is what truly means to practice it back and forth. In the previous method, we had a very short sequence of two notes, but our goal is constantly to expand the sequence so that we can do longer runs without mistakes. Here is what brilliance comes from, because just by trying to play the passage faster and faster, you will just be making more mistakes, all kinds of different mistakes that your fingers will pick up, and that's how you will always be playing that piece. Sloppy, with a bunch of occasional mistakes, those mistakes will be so random, you won't even know how to fix them. So as another side note, let's get that myth out of your system. It might sound counterintuitive to you, but no, you are not learning to play at the fast tempo by just desperately playing fast. You're carefully increasing the tempo by widening those sequence runs, pacing yourself with a stop at particular keys following the pattern. The next sequence grows from 2 to 4 notes for such time signatures as 2 fourth, 3 fourth and 4 fourth. Because of how beaming works, we are not playing in a sequence of 3 notes. We are skipping it. Yep, so far all of you who thought science is too difficult, I'd rather do music. Sorry to disappoint you, buddy. So here we go in the sequence of 4 16th notes, you would stop at the first one again. Freeze, look up all the notes and finger until the first note of the next sequence and run to that next stop. too fast if you can't get it safe without mistakes. 
In fact, in the beginning, when you're just learning how to practice with these methods, you would play pretty slow, just trying to figure out where to stop, what to play. After a couple of months, it becomes your second nature and finally starts to bring benefits. I would even say that your first multiple musical pieces you practice these methods with will be kind of experimental. See, most of the folks and even piano teachers will teach you how to just play one little part at a time, dozens of times, but without the right intention, your professional growth graph will look something like this. You will get noticeable results in the beginning, which might inspire you, but down the road, your skills will be capped because of the poor habits that you implemented in the beginning. Practicing with those methods I just showed you takes a lot of patience and we always try to figure out how to make it less daunting, trying to joke around, implementing some game aspects in our lessons, but your professional growth graph will be exponential if you survive through that. Back to the method. After you stopped at the first 16th note and played it three times, you are moving to the next second 16th note. In the sequence. Don't worry if a note doesn't exist at a particular number, stop or placeholder. There is probably a rest instead of it and it means that another hand has a note or you stop. At that position you might still hold the previous note. Don't worry if that's too confusing. I will lead you through some of the examples. By the way, if it sounds confusing, that's probably because you're not yet ready to dig it. In that case, you might want to save this video to the Watch Later playlist or subscribe to this channel so you can always find it along with other useful tips. When you feel ready, you're not gonna want to lose this video, but make sure to watch till the end, but I'm actually gonna show you some examples, so you'll probably get it. After you stop at the second 16th note or a position holder for whatever musical symbol, you do it three times and move on to do the same thing to the third and the fourth stop. Make sure you don't make a gap before the next group of 16th notes or any other numbers except your current stop. students use that sequence up to four notes at a time for about two to three years. I also don't teach those methods to all of my students. I do not or do not yet teach those methods to those people who I believe are not ready to perceive them and implement them properly. But usually after the sequence of four notes, we would move on to eight notes. You would stop at the first note again, just like with the four note sequence, but now you'll have a longer passage of eight notes to run through. In key signatures like three fourth, we don't play up to eight stops per sequence because of the way beaming works. You won't be able to divide 12 16th notes by eight without having a remainder of four notes. You would have to settle for only having a sequence of four notes. Instead, if you want to have a longer sequence, we would practice by 8th notes, not 16th notes. Meaning, there will be 6 stops per measure, because there are 6 8th notes in a measure. And again, that's only because it's 3-4 time. I would usually start introducing dotted method not earlier than 6 months into piano lessons, or over a year. 
Non legato is not as difficult because it's actually the first thing you learn on the piano before you play legato. And all different piano methods tend to agree on that you have to start with non legato first. But the stop method where you have the sequence of four or more notes is way more challenging than the rest of the methods. I don't remember if I ever asked a six year old to practice the stop method. And if I ever did, I probably regretted that. They would probably be able to get it, but for these methods to bring a great value, I would say a student should be at least seven years old and be at least one year in two lessons. And even then, I would recommend one being supervised by a parent or a tutor. This is what absolutely blew my mind a couple of months ago when I realized you can actually supplement your regular piano lessons with tutoring so inexpensively. Since then, I recommend outsourcing affordable online tutoring to everyone who would like an extra boost to supplement their regular piano lessons to keep up with their practice. Check out this video if you're curious how this works. That was another side note, but also useful. So to prolong the sequence in three fourth time signatures, you can stop at eighth notes only. At three fourth measures will look like this in terms of eighth notes. It may consist of any pattern, but your stop points will be at first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth placeholders, if you wish. And here's what it's gonna sound like. I encourage you to count for at least two to three months while you're learning this. If you're playing wrong fingering here and there, you're memorizing that wrong fingering pretty solidly. So please help yourself out by counting all of those stops out loud. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, and so on. Make sure with all those stops, you're making a decently long stop. You have to freeze for longer than you probably think and then do a faster run to the next stop. You've probably heard that making mistakes in the process of learning is okay, but we are actually trying to minimize mistakes as much as possible so that our fingers don't get to remember wrong notes. Another reason why we have to make longer stops is because we get that extra time to analyze the sequence until the following stop. Look for the right notes and fingering. That way, once again, we are making sure we are minimizing mistakes. Usually in the first couple of months, those methods bring very little benefit because you're just learning how to use that tool. And only after that, you use it comfortably with any other piece. So if it looks difficult right now, trust me, it will become your second nature. You won't even blink. And that's where, unfortunately, most of the students give up without getting used to it. That's why I would slowly introduce this method to not scare the students. You don't have to do all of the different combinations. When you're just starting out, you don't have to practice the whole piece like that. But if you want that crispy, clear quality of your most challenging passages, and you remember the graph that I showed you with exponential growth when you use the methods, right? This is the tool that goes the long way with you. I'm gonna recap all the methods that I've mentioned so far. I'm gonna play them right now. Feel free to skip through if you think that you already got it, but if not, it would be a good idea to play along with me or to just watch where I am. Dotted method, short sequence of two notes. Stop at the first and the second note. Play the passage three times doing each of the stops in a sequence. everything non legato three times even if it says to play legato even if you see the slurs there length you define, for example, four note sequence, stop at each of the notes in the sequence three times. to 
passage with me, that should already add up to 21 times that you play that passage. It is so much harder to just ask a student to drill something 20 times without a specific purpose. These methods, although pretty challenging, don't put too much pressure on the student psychologically because three repetitions here and there doesn't seem too much as opposed to just playing 20 times. Other options with stop method. For even longer runs, we could try playing by quarter notes. The sequence becomes longer and now you'll be able to perform a longer run without mistakes pretty rapidly. The thing is, if you just keep trying to play fast without making controlled stops, you can lose your attention, start making mistakes and overall play would turn out sloppy and uneven. I usually do quarter note stops with more advanced students. Too many options would be overwhelming in the beginning, although if in 6th, 8th time signature piece you got the passage full of 16th notes, you'll probably want to practice stop method in 16th notes, because the first 3 8th notes would also be under one beam. So that translates to the sequence of 6 16th notes because of how beaming works. Since you got two groups of 3 8th notes per measure, you got 12 16th notes per measure. And the proper grouping would be 6 plus 6. That's why it's a good idea to have 6 note sequence when practicing with the stop method. So you get two stops per measure every 6 16th notes. Practicing by 8th notes for longer runs will look like this. Because each 8th note consists of two 16th notes, it looks like you stop every other 16th note in 3 4th time signature pieces again because of the grouping or beaming. Practicing by 16th notes look like that. So a 4 note sequence would be optimal. Since you cannot break the middle group of 16th notes, you cannot play in a 6 note sequence. If you try to practice in the 8th note sequence, you will run out of the 16th notes for that measure to complete two equal groups of 16th notes, because there are no 16 16th notes per measure, there are only 12. And no, you cannot go over the bar line, because that way it will lose symmetry. You could do a 12th note sequence, but that's ridiculous. 12 stops and then you would have to play each three times, even I don't have patience like that. So again, in that case, you would just play by eight notes in a six note sequence, as mentioned before. For those of you who don't get the difference between three, fourth and six, eighth time signatures, the main difference is in the accents. In three, fourth, there are three beats so that the slight accent happens to every odd eighth note first, second, and third, those are known as the on-the-beat notes. In 6th, 8th, an 8th note is a beat, so there are 6 beats per measure, but instead of accenting all of them, it is common a thing to accent the 1st and the 4th 8th notes, meaning 1st and 4th beats, so that it sounds like 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, or one, two, three, four, five, six, if you want to count up to six. We sometimes count up to three for the simplicity. Because of that, beaming rules have been set so that those accented notes happen to be the first note of each group for easier perception and smoother performance. Again, some things might seem overly complicated, but that complexity has intentionally been created with the perspective in mind. It will be easier down the road. Due to some specifics of specific music and ambiguities, I cannot discuss every single variation now. That wouldn't be just boring and too long, but it's also not possible to discuss in a one video. Good news! You don't have to know all of these. You don't have to explain it to your child in depth if you're a parent of studying student. This was an explanation of how I achieve clarity and crispness of technically challenging passages with my students. Be rest assured, all these passages were practiced exactly this way. If your child is studying piano, those are the methods that need to be supervised either by you or the tutor who is supplementing your child's regular piano lessons. If you are too busy and cannot devote enough time supervising him, or if you don't understand any of this yourself, you can totally have 
piano lessons without any of those methods. But then don't cry if you cannot get that passage right. There are more methods and techniques that I use, but that's gonna be in later videos. I'm sure you'll want feedback, so let's do that. You can record a short vertical video for no more than 58 seconds describing your question. Make it as clear as possible. You can show a specific part in the sheet music that you are having trouble with. You can perform a short segment on that video so that I can give you my recommendations. Upload this clip to your YouTube channel and drop the link to that video in the comment section of this video. By doing this, you agree to publicly share it, let me use your clip or a part of it in any of my videos. I might publicly give you advice on how to improve whatever it is you're trying to learn on piano. At the very least, I'll chat with you in the comment section on that matter. It was Olga with you. If that video was helpful as a thank you like this video so that I know it was, subscribe if you want more of the videos with lectures, helpful tips, music theory, ear training and improvisation and many more, all helping you become a better piano player. Here's the next video YouTube things you might want to watch. Bye!